When I was 14, I took in this grey cat. I found him on the roadside, making the most pathetic meow you could imagine, and brought him home. When I was busy thinking about giving him some cool name, my mother started calling him Grey. That was the kind of person my mom was. It's a grey cat, let's call him Grey. I complained, but uh, in the end I couldn't offer up an alternative. Grey completely ignored the chair and cushion we prepared for him, and spent his time all around the house, pondering cat stuff and sleeping. Then, half a year later, he must have come to the conclusion that he didn't belong here, because Grey disappeared somewhere. I was 15. I don't know how old he was. Maybe he didn't like it here. That's what boys do. They leave home. There was a knowing look in my mother's face when she said this one night when we were reminiscing about Grey. I'd never even thought about leaving home and leaving my mother behind. I wanted to start earning my way so I could help her out. My mother worked in a cafe during the day and in a bar in the evening until late into the night. She was constantly exhausted, but when I found a job, there was always some reason to give up on the idea. It was my heart. But I had surgery when I was five, so it should be all clear. And since then, it's been absolutely fine. I've been the picture of health, if I say so myself. Hey, I've been thinking. I really want to work. That'll make it easier for you, won't it? Thank you. But in two years, when you're 17... Mom was playing with the waves of her beautiful, though reeking of tobacco smoke blonde hair with her fingers as she spoke. Why 17? Because I'm sure Grey was 17 too. It didn't make any sense at all. Why would working and leaving home mean the same thing? I thought we should have talked it out, but it was painful to have to talk to her while she was drunk. Half a year later, I saw Grey in the street. Well, a cat that looked like Grey. He turned into a stray, missing the tip of one of his ears and covered in scars. I called out to him and he just looked at me without a hint of enthusiasm. But he soon looked away and started walking off. I followed him, and without even turning around, he climbed up the fence of a nearby house and made his way up to the roof. He was now completely out of reach. I want to work, wait a bit. The same conversation played out at regular intervals. Most of my friends were working, and even if they weren't, they must have at least been earning their own spending money. It felt like they were all up on that roof, laughing at me. Midgar Sector 6, the end of a busy street lined with shops and restaurants. Our house was just down an alley, nestled between a bookshop and a weaponsmith that was damp and reeked of rust. Houses with the kind of basic shapes you'd see in a kid's drawing, made of some material that looked like brick, were bunched together there. It was apparently used as a housing area for lower level Shinra company employees for a while after Midgar was completed. Later on, company housing was moved to sector 5 and 7. The area was supposed to be demolished until some rich guy who ran a couple of bars leased them from Shinra for the workers in his businesses to live in. The rent was dirt cheap. A lot of the people who had come to Midgar from the world below, rural areas or the slums, with dreams of making something of themselves lived here. Everyone was poor. This was the sort of place for people who didn't make it among the relatively wealthy populace of Midgar. But everyone agreed. It beat living in the slums. It was about one week before my 17th birthday. The sound of the phone woke me up. I could hear my mom talking in a quiet voice. When I got up, she was cleaning up in the kitchen. Cleaning and tidying, in other words, maintaining order in the home, was my job. Studying at my teacher's home, talking with my friends, wandering around town, staring at a TV with bad reception. For someone all but devoid of actual responsibilities, this was my sole contribution to our life. I've never cut corners there. When I argued that I had done it yesterday, she told me that we had a guest coming over. I'd like you to meet him. So can you go get changed? She said that without even looking at me. Something felt wrong about it, and that hunch proved true. 
Nick Foley was in his mid-thirties, like Mom. His tall frame was covered by a well-tailored grey suit. Above a light pink necktie with white dots sat his little handsome face. He stood in the doorway, a pleasant smile across his face as he looked down at me. Call me Nick. I work at the Shinra Company's business department. With the way he was smiling and introducing himself, it was like he thought we could be friends already. If I let my guard down, I might have actually ended up calling him Nick. You take after your dad, you know. <laughs> Judging from the look on his face, Nick Foley wished he hadn't said that. Wait, you knew my dad? My dad died in Wutai just before I was born. There's not even a single picture of him, so I don't know what he looked like. What? Uh, no, I just meant that you don't look much like your mom. I've heard what happened. Sorry. But you're a good-looking boy, right? I bet you do well for yourself with the girls. I must have been making quite a face, because Nick Foley started looking at my mother for assistance. Do you want some of this cake Nick brought? It's from Mrs. Tosca's. She made too much of a noise as she sat the plates on the table and placed a slice of that overly decorated cake on them. Eating one of Mrs. Tosca's insanely expensive mounds of sugar and cream was a treat my mother reserved for when she got paid. She liked to take the time to enjoy it, this little reward to herself. Come on, you two, sit down. So, here it is. Been wanting to try these cakes ever since I heard about them. Normally, I don't care for sweet stuff at all. Nick sat in my seat as he rambled on about some random crap. <sighs> Please just die. The smile vanished from my mother's face. There were three chairs around the table. Out of the remaining two, I sat opposite the enemy. My mother's seat. She sat in on a chair saved for the very rare visitor we had. Nick Foley must have noticed the chill in the air too. He let out a heavy sigh and looked right at me. He put his elbows on the table and folded his hands in front of his face. I had wanted to meet you a lot sooner, but I could just never find the time. It's really cutting it close now. You've heard about me, right? Nick Foley looked at my mother. Sorry, I just... Great. Well, the arrangements are all set now so we can't move the date. We're leaving Midgar in two days. Get your things ready. What are you talking about? I've talked it over with your mother several times. You're just going to have to come along. You are family, after all. I'll head off home now. But if there's anything you want to know more about, your mother will- I swept the cake off the table along with the plate and slammed my foot on the ground as I got up and went straight out the front door. Evan! The sound of the plate shattering rang in my ears. I felt bad about doing something so unlike me. When I've calmed down, I'll, I'll go home and talk to mom. There seems to be a lot of stuff I don't know. But still, leaving in two days? Leaving to where? No, it, it doesn't matter. I don't want to go. I'm not going anywhere with him. I decided to kill time for two days. Then I would go home. If I did that, Nick Foley and my mother's plans would be shot. It's probably going to be a little awkward for a while, but, uh, but what can you do? Things will get back to normal soon enough, I kept thinking to myself as I walked through Sector 7 to the warehouse block in Sector 8, the usual destination for teenage runaways. And then I got caught up in the Sector 7 plate incident. The several support struts that lift up the massive weight of Midgar's giant circular base from the ground below. The seventh strut was blown up by terrorists, bringing the plate down onto the slums below. A lot of lives were lost. At the moment of the explosion, I was at the border of Sector 7 and 8. When the city shook from the blast, I instantly ran in the direction of Sector 8. At first I had no idea what was going on. I ran without thinking following the droves of people. Eventually I learned that Sector 7 had collapsed. There was news that Sector 8 was safe, but nothing certain. I was worried about my mother. I tried to get back home through Sector 0 in the middle of the city, but that route was sealed off by the Shinra army on the lookout for terrorists. Having no choice, I decided to work my way backwards, going through 8, 1, 2 and so on. The people were afraid of where the next explosion would be. 
These deranged terrorists had just blown up the Sector 1 Mako reactor recently. It was three days later when I reached home, after having gone nearly full circle around Midgar. It took me three days for what would have taken one day of walking the shortest distance without resting. I got lost in the unfamiliar streets of Sector 8 and got into a panic. Before long, it was night. The cold breeze that came from the gaps in the warehouses mercilessly sapped the warmth from my body. Cursing my body for its weakness, I looked for a place to lie down. I finally stumbled across an empty warehouse and collapsed onto an abandoned mattress. Then out of nowhere appeared a couple of guys looking at me with this nasty glint in their eyes. They were the same age as me, but if I were a house cat, these were strays. They insisted I pay to use this spot, claimed those were the rules around these parts, but I had nothing at all to give them. In the end, giving them someone to vent their dissatisfaction on was how I paid up. It was killing me where they kicked me in the back and stomach, and a night's rest didn't do much in the way of making me feel any better, but I didn't want to pay those charges again to stay here. More than worrying about my mother, I just wanted to go home. I mustered up the energy and left the stray's den. I staggered along, taking frequent breaks on the way, and managed to arrive home just past noon on the third day. The house was okay. Mom was out, but this was usual when she was at work. I took some cold medicine and crawled into bed. I fell asleep as I decided to go see my mother when I got up. It was nighttime when I woke. Still wasn't feeling great, but probably good enough to make it to the bar and back. First I took a shower. I dried myself off with a towel and went back to my room, put on some underwear and some black pants. I picked an oversized sweater which hid my body to wear on top, a navy blue one. This was the most grown up combination of clothes in my wardrobe. My tall but lanky build was the target of ridicule at the bar. I was certain to end up barraged by the same old remarks, you know, telling the kid to have a glass of milk and run off to bed. Just before I headed out the door, the thought of leaving my bed a mess started bothering me. When I was straightening out the thin blanket and pillow, I noticed an envelope that had been placed under it. Inside was a large sum of money and a letter from Mom. I read the letter. I'm going with Nick, as we planned. We'll contact you to tell you where we are as soon as we've settled down. Use the money in the envelope to live on and wait for me to call. Leave half of it to pay for the trip to our new home. The whole thing was utterly impersonal and businesslike. The Sector 7 incident had happened the day I ran out of the house. She must have known about it and the extent of the damage. But she left with a man without even making sure her own son was safe and she thinks that I would just come running whenever she tells me where she is? I didn't get it. I went to my mother's room and opened the closet door. On the hangers were a few outfits for her daytime job that looked a bit too youthful for her age, and several horrible ones for her night job. It looks like she left her work behind too. The clothes she wore off work, that were usually strewn in a mess beneath them, were gone. I sat on my mother's bed for a while, absent-minded, Then I suddenly remembered our family's little secret hidden in the ceiling. I brought a chair in from the dining room and placed it in the middle of the floor. I got up on it and stretched out my hands, removing one of the ceiling tiles. I gently threw the tile on the bed and looked up at the square hole that had opened up in the ceiling. Mom had hidden a chest up there. Inside there was money and treasures. The money was her weekly wages, and the treasures were my first somethings. My umbilical cord, hair from my first haircut, the first baby tooth I lost. Each one creepy any way you look at it. But to my mother, I guess they were all irreplaceable treasures. As I stuck my hand up into the ceiling, my fingertips hit the chest. It seemed to have gotten pushed back, so I couldn't grab hold of it. I grabbed hold of the edge of the next tile with both hands and lifted my body up. I was going to stick my head up to check it out, but the tile broke. I fell, losing my balance on the chair, and nearly falling over, I landed on the floor. 
In front of my eyes were pieces of the broken ceiling tile and the treasure chest. There were also two paper bags. When I opened the chest, an old wooden cheese box that I had drawn these purple apples that I used to like in crayon when I was little. When I opened the chest, all of the treasures were still safely there, and the money, which I guess was what was left of her wages. In other words, the money under my pillow wasn't the money that was here. Then where did it come from? Nick piece of shit Foley's wallet? Next I opened one of the bags I hadn't seen before. It was white and brand new. When I looked inside it, I couldn't believe it. Mind-boggling would be the perfect adjective to describe the amount of money in the bag. I could live comfortably for a year. The money, like the bag, was new. The wrapper on one of the stacks of bills was loose. The money under my pillow seemed to have come from here. I felt like I had gotten to the bottom of the mystery, and it started to make sense. But that was not the heart of the problem. Where did the money come from? I could only think of one person. Nick fucking loaded Foley. The other bag was made of a thicker pale green paper. When I took the tape off the opening, there was a dun-coloured leather bag. It was a sturdy build, with a flap with a metal fastener. It had the kind of drabness you'd expect from military equipment or something. It had a strap you could adjust the length of. It was the kind of shoulder bag you'd think would belong to a grown man, and a hardened adventurer at that. When I opened the flap, there was a small card inside the bag. Happy 17th birthday. I hope you become the kind of strong man worthy of this bag. Mom. My mother had prepared a birthday present for me, hidden it, and left. Disappeared with some good-looking man, left behind a pile of money and her son. How does all this fit together? I sat on my mother's bed and thought about it, but it didn't seem like I was going to find the right answer. My mother would contact me someday. I just had to wait until then. For now, I decided to fix the ceiling. I picked up the broken ceiling tile and got up on the chair and returned it to its original location. Next, the first tile I removed. This one didn't fit in place properly. My arms started getting tired while I was working on it. I started getting irritable and had no choice but to face up to the unpleasant reality I couldn't shake out of my mind. My mother was short and even if she stood on the chair, she couldn't reach the ceiling. When I had grown taller than mom, it was my idea to use the space behind the ceiling as storage. Since then, it had been my duty to take things out of and put things into the chest. That's how I knew how much my mother made, how much she had left, and how poor we were. And therein lies the question. Who put the money and the gift I just found up in the ceiling? The man who looked down at me in the doorway. Nick, son of a bitch, Foley. That man had been in my mother's room while I was gone. I abandoned the work and went to the phone next to the front door and pulled the cable from the base. They're going to see how angry I am. Things started getting back to normal. I was going to my teachers, talking to my friends, watching TV. I thought about splashing out with the money, but when I thought that it might be Nick Foley's money, I decided against it. <laughs> no. The truth is, I just couldn't think of anything to do with it. In the end, I put the money in the shoulder bag and decided to just forget all about it. For nights, I couldn't sleep. One evening, I struck on the idea of reading a book. Reading was my mother's sole hobby. In her room were several books she had finished. I picked out Escape from Wutai, Part 1, because it was the last one on the end, that's all. It was an old novel written during the war. The beginning consisted of a lot of scenes of Wutaians using some weird martial arts to kill prisoners in the camps. Eventually five of the prisoners slipped past a stupid Wu Tian and escaped the camp. Three men and two women. There's one too many. I figured someone was probably going to die. Probably this Shinra military officer jerk off. However, the officer defied my expectations and lived. 
and started acting like a leader and pushing the other four around. I wished he would die soon. I got my wish near the last page. The officer was blown to bits by one of the landmines the Wutaians had planted. The way he died shocked me. He was blown to bits by a Wutai landmine. This was the only story my mother had told me about my father. Maybe she got it from this novel. Did she project my father onto this man who was bound to die? That was probably the case. She must have really hated him. I admired how she could have raised the son of a man like that. <laughs> no. Maybe it was exactly because I was the child that man had left behind that when the time came, she was able to abandon me like this. I thought I was loved, but was that just a mask for her hatred? I threw the book against the wall, like I gave a damn what happened to the other four in part two. I went back into my mother's room and looked at her book collection. I could tell from the titles that they were all adventure novels. On the covers were illustrations of what looked like the main character. They were all sorts of characters, but all women. So my mother loved that kind of novel, the sort of sights and adventures missing from her own life. And though I didn't want to think about it, maybe she liked the romance. Was life with me that boring? Was it painful? <sighs> That's enough. My mother left, and I'm left behind. I'm just going to stop thinking about her. I need to start thinking about living on my own. The next day, I visited the cafe she used to work at. The manager, a man with the square forehead and broad shoulders of a retro robot, ranted at length about my mother's sudden quitting. I kind of prepared for this, but it got to me a bit more than I had imagined. After a long stream of complaints, he seemed to remember to ask what I was there for. I told him I wanted a job. From the flow of the conversation, I figured I was in for a rejection, but he called the owner right there and then. I couldn't understand what was going on in his mind, but then again, I didn't even know how my own mother felt. Surprisingly, I was able to start work pretty soon. The delivery truck that transported the food and drink to all of the owner's businesses. My job was being his assistant. My predecessor had got a job with the Shinra company and had just gleefully quit his job. It was a fulfilling life. This was the joy of work. I enjoyed the total change of scenery. Of course, there was never a day I didn't think about mom. But still, it got me away from thinking about it 24-7. I put the phone cable back to normal about 10 days after unplugging it. Maybe my mother had tried to contact me during that time. It was possible that the phone had rang while I was out of the house as well. But the phone wasn't the only way to get in touch. The fact that there was nothing was a sign that she had abandoned me after all. <sighs> Whatever. Mom, I hope you're happy. I'm enjoying my life. The truck driver was a hard boss to work for, but I knew he needed me more than anyone else. I'd never had that experience before in my life. Regardless of the heavy labor, I wasn't worried about my heart at all. I'd gotten confident about that too. What do you think about that, Mom? I started to think those days would last, but the situation quickly changed. The channel seemed to have turned itself over in the middle of a show. A meteor had appeared in the sky above Midgar. This thing that had just suddenly appeared in defiance of all astronomical knowledge looked like a massive black void in the sky. There were rumors going around that the world would end in seven days. Giant monsters had appeared in the north and around Junon, and even Shinra's prized weaponry couldn't defeat them. The city was in chaos, with crazy rumors like you'd be safe if you hid in the Mako reactors, or there was an underground shelter Shinra had built in Kaum. The only thing anyone knew for sure was that Meteor was getting closer day by day. The arguments about the truth about Meteor and how to avoid it soon subsided. The owner closed his shops and left Midgar, and the neighborhood was filled with the din of people getting ready to evacuate. My friends, the driver and his workmates, asked me to flee with them somewhere far away. 
but I just thanked them and declined. Seeing Meteor was the first time in my life I had considered death. Then all I could think about was my mother and the awkward circumstances we had parted in. If I left the house, I felt like I'd lose all connection to her. I spent the time looking at a few pictures of me and her. They were all taken by a photographer on my birthdays. I was standing next to my mother, gradually growing up. After I had gotten taller than her, I started pulling this sulky face in the pictures. My mother was always smiling. I looked at that smiling face and realized how stupid I had been. Mom wouldn't abandon me. All the things I had done ran through my mind. If I had gone to the Shinra company, I might have found out where Nick Foley was. I probably should have put the phone back right away and installed an answering machine. And then the answers to the questions I didn't even try to think about came to mind. The purpose of all the money left up in the ceiling. Wherever it had come from, the reason she left the money was because she planned on coming straight back. Or maybe for me to bring it to her. That seems likely. Mom never even considered living away from me for a long time. And there was my birthday present. Mom took birthdays very seriously. She would have made some arrangements so I'd have that shoulder bag on the right day. She would have wrote about it in the letter, or put it somewhere easier to find. But she didn't, because she planned on contacting me soon. I should have just shut up and waited by the phone. The joy of work? I'm an idiot. And then that day came. I survived the day the Mako energy, or, well, the live stream, burst to the surface and wiped out Meteor. For seven days after that, I waited at home for my mother. On the night of the seventh day, I stepped outside and ended up going down from Midgar to the slums. Now, I'll tell you about something that happened two years later. I'll probably talk about some stuff that happened in those two years as well. I'd like to pick the best route possible so to avoid getting sidetracked. But like I already said, I'm not too great at making choices. Hopefully you'll bear with me. I'll also sometimes bring up things I shouldn't really know about. Times like those I'll use the facts as the basis and use a bit of imagination to fill in the rest. For example, something like this. <laughs> 